chiropractic school that Dr. Carrick visited us at Life West and he gave a two hour presentation and everybody skipped off to watch it and it just like blew my mind. You know, he, I watched him help one woman with Tourette's and it was gone in like an hour. Her Tourette's was gone. And I was like, this looks like functional neurology could be the hardest and best thing in chiropractic. And not knowing much more than that, just kind of going off that, I jumped into it my first year. And so for the last two years, I've been doing one module a month and in San Francisco, each module is a whole weekend. We dive into all different topics of the nervous system. And it's given me a really profound understanding of chiropractic neurology. And I've kind of mixed my own blend of vitalism into it to make something kind of interesting. I'm gonna be sharing that with you guys today. So I just kind of want to get a show of hands who's in their first year here. Sweet, and who's in their second year? And we have any third years here? Sweet. All right. So some of what I'm going to say is going to be a little bit new to you guys. But just stay open-minded. Um, let's try and keep our questions till the end because I got like 38 slides, so we're going to climb on this. So our topics today. We're going to be talking about subluxation, we're going to be talking about the adjustment, if we have time we're going to talk about a little bit of patient management and how I look after my people. So let's get started. Mechavitalism is a term that I have coined. Um, I did this at Step Into the Future and what it talks about is that I'm really into the vitalism and the philosophy of chiropractic and I was like pulled into it my first quarter. I was watching videos in the library every lunch break of Reggie Gold and and when I got into the neurology and we started talking about all the mechanisms of why things work, it was conflicting with my vitalistic philosophy. And so I kind of had this schizophrenia about it for a while. And I would be going back and forth. And it took me about a year until I really began to understand that mechanism and vitalism are not separate entities. They're not on the opposite side of the spectrum. That there is a me middle meeting ground. And that if you look and see things through the right colored lenses, You'll understand the mechanisms support the vitalistic philosophy that chiropractic has stood with for 115 years now. And so mechavitalism is something that we'll kind of be blending into today's conversation. So this one, I kind of I like to start with this because I think this is just an incredible, um, incredible cut. It's one system all put together, so just imagine dissecting this. But this is kind of a visual I see when I'm working with people is I'll close my eyes and in my head there's a three-dimensional person and I disappear everything off that body except the nervous system. So all I see is a brain, the spinal cord, the nerves. And when you start thinking about it this way, think of an action potential as a tiny little yellow light that's zooming through this. And then multiply that by a couple trillion. And when you see it, you just see this glowing yellow nervous system with billions of messages flying through it. And that's not just a philosophy, that's actually what is going on if you strip everything away. And so when I think about it like that, I think of where are these little yellow lights stopping? Where are they glowing down? Where are they not as bright as they should be? What is the adjustment doing to a system like this? How is it affecting it? So this is kind of a visual that I want you guys to keep in mind as we go through today. So, can anybody tell me what's going on here? This is our classic subluxation model. And there's a lot that is true about this, and there's a lot that's false about this. What's true about this is the vertebra becomes stuck, becomes fixated, and within 24 hours, you're having fibrotic changes within the capsule, you're forming scar tissue, you're losing imbibition and nutrition to the joint, so the joint starts to decay, and this goes on for years. As the joint decays, it becomes more prone to injury, it becomes more prone to injury, you get micro tears in the disc that causes a reflexogenic inhibition to the multifidi, those get fatty infiltration, the whole system goes to shit, and you start getting pain in the area. So subluxation causes pain and damage in the long term. But that little red nerve coming out is not exactly true. That's a radiculopathy. That's a nerve being pinched by the disc, it could be pinched by a tumor, could be pinched by bony stenosis, but it doesn't get pinched by subluxation. Because if it did, every time you have a subluxation, you'd have nerve pain coming down, you could trace it along your arm. And if that's really what it was, that means that chiropractic is only adjusts radiculopathies, and that's contraindicated for the record. It's supposed to adjust below, above and below. So that red is inappropriate, it's not right. 
And so when we say that, and we say the cell pulsation of the bone has put a complete pressure on the nerve, causing interference with the nerve system, and this isn't true, then what exactly is going on? And these are concepts that we're going to talk about. So it all is about the dorsal horn of the spinal cord is really where all of this starts to go to shit. So you think about there's muscle spindles and joint capsules, just thousands of them around each vertebra, thousands of them. And they're in every ligament structure there, and they're in every disc. And every time you move, they always fire off. And every time they fire off, they fire into this dorsal horn. Now, there's a lot of integration that goes on there. You're going to inhibit pain right at that spinal cord level. But the pain, if you don't inhibit it, is actually going to fire off your sympathetic. So you'll get sympathetic changes in the system, too. And so as you're subluxated and you're not firing off those muscle spindles, what we call that is disafferentation. You guys have heard of disafferentation before? Disafferentation is afferents, our messages going from the body to the brain, efferents are going out. The afferents coming in, they're wrong. And Latin, wrong, is dis, so disafferentation. You have an inappropriate message feeding into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, and then that starts to decay. It's not able to function the way it was designed to. And what that does is it causes diastasis. Now, I want you guys all to write down the word diastasis and go home and research it because this is, I think, the most important term for us as chiropractors to know. Diastasis is a problem in one part of the nervous system will create changes in another part of the nervous system that is anatomically separate but functionally connected. So what does this mean? It means that the spine has input that fires up to the brain. But when the spine isn't working right, and that's a lesion in one part of your nervous system, it's going to cause problems in the brain. Because the brain is anatomically separate from the spine, but it's functionally connected. And so this is what, diastasis is not a chiropractic term, this is a well-documented medical term. And usually they're saying that a cortical uh, lesion can cause degeneration in the cerebellum on the opposite side or other lesions like that, but they never applied it to the spine and to the brain. And this is so important because the spine is the primary tonic input to the brain. And when you start to think about it like that, you think of the brain kind of as an engine and it needs always needs to be stimulated to keep running. If it doesn't get activation and input from afferents from the body, it starts to lose the fuel. The spine is literally the fuel. And when we became upright mammals in gravity, we stood upright, we loaded our spine in gravity, and that allowed a surge of information to go to the brain. And that's actually one of the neurologic models for why the human brain is so sophisticated, is because we stand upright. When we load our spine in gravity, we get more input to the brain. So when you start thinking like that, a problem in the spine with a subluxation is going to cause insult to the brain. Brain's going to go through diastasis changes. And what's going to happen at that point is the cells in the brain start to decay. So we talk about transneural degeneration is across neurons degenerating. And a neuron needs three things to survive. Fundamentally, no matter whenever you have a lesion or anybody comes in with a problem, you think that there's three things causing the problem. Either the brain or the neurons are not getting the oxygen they need. They could be anemic. They could have a stroke. They could have all sorts of problems. They could have bleed. But the brain's not getting the oxygen it needs, and now it starts to become ischemic, and the cells start to move towards transdermal degeneration. You could have bad energy. Um, you could have a loss of cofactors. You know, the brain needs CoQ10. And if there is no CoQ10 in the diet, there's none in the blood, none to the brain, the brain's going to go through transdermal degeneration. And the last one's activation. And this is so important because this is where we specialize as chiropractors, is the adjustment gives activation to your system. And now the neurons start to thrive. But what happens is when the neurons don't get any of these three or they're missing one of them, they start going into transdermal degeneration. And TND is a process where every time you stimulate the neuron, you're going to end up stimulating the DNA within it. And then you're gonna start making products out of the DNA. So one of the products is going to be anionic protein. These are very negatively charged proteins that live inside this neural body, and they keep it negatively charged. So as you lose activation, you stop making so many of these proteins, and it starts, the cell 
creeps from a resting membrane potential of negative 65 over to 60 over to 55. And in the end, what happens is it's overall easier to stimulate that neuron, but it fatigues quickly because it's not producing ATP as much because it's not being stimulated. And this is what TND is called. So how would you see transneural degeneration in a patient? It means that you're going to challenge them. You're going to challenge them with a dysdiatocokinesis. You're going to say, I want you to move your arms. And they've got transneural degeneration in this right cerebellum. So he, originally, that arm's going to be moving really well because it's quick to activation. But immediately, it's going to fatigue. And so they're going to be like this. Like, they're going to just give up after a second. And so that's how we notice that there's transneural degeneration going on in the system. You can do different tests in different areas. You can test the muscle. Yeah. What was that? Hip seeks for cerebellum. So you can see it in all different areas. If it's in the spinal cord and the motor cortex, you can do a muscle test and it'll be really strong initially and it'll just fatigue out. That's how we test TND. But this is the idea that subluxation through diastasis causes transneural degeneration in the brain. You guys follow all of that? <coughs> Say it again. <laughs> subluxation through diastasis and diastetic changes causes transneural degeneration in the brain because now the brain's not getting the activation and it starts to go through this degenerative process. And that's the worst thing that could happen. So this is how functional neurology looks at all of these changes. Is you start with a signal in one half of the brain. So let's say the left hemisphere is where it begins. And the left hemisphere wants to control the body so it fires down to the ipsilateral brainstem. Now think of the PMRF, the pontomedullary reticular formation, is between the pons and the medulla in the brainstem. And this area controls a whole bunch of functions in the body ipsilateral that we're going to start talking about. But what the functional neurology sees is that when the left brain begins to fail, it cannot adequately fire to that left PMRF. Now 90% of the left brain's output is going to go to that PMRF on the same side. Only 10% of this brain is going to go to voluntarily control muscles on the opposite side. So when you say left brain controls your right arm, that's only 10% of its output. The other 90% is to that PMRF on the same side. So the PMRF then makes a series of um, controls on the left side of the body, it's lateral to it, and that helps control a lot of different functions on that body. Now what happens is the right brain is dependent upon information from the left part of the body, proprioceptive input, etc. So that left side of the body <coughs> feeds over to the right brain, and then you get the same thing. Right brain to the right brain stem, to the body, back to the left brain. And so this is kind of the figure eight that we see in functional neurology. And I think it's really interesting because in vitalism, we see a safety pin, and in functional neurology, we see a figure eight. But they're similar in a lot of ways. And so what happens is when there's a disconnect, it's a little bit more complicated than just a broken safety pin. You see signs of a failing PMRF. Now this is what it's gonna look like, is that pontomedullary reticular formation has different outputs, and the outputs are opposite of what I listed here. So if the brainstem fails on the right side, what you see <coughs> is you're gonna see increased sympathetic tone unilaterally. So you take a patient and you look at them and you see which pupil is bigger. And the right pupil is bigger. That means that there's increased sympathetic tone on that right side. Then you look at their hands, that white hand is blanched. It's totally white. I mean, there's incre decreased blood flow because there's increased sympathetic tone. Does that make sense? Then you look in their eyes and you see that there's a vein to artery ratio. There's a hundred different sympathetic markers you can look for. But look for sympathetics being higher on one side of the body than the other. Um, it does tone above T6 and tone below T6. So if you have a failing right brainstem on this side, what you see is this arm will rotate in and that leg will rotate out. And it was going to be really, really minute <coughs> on people, but you'll just see this and that. And you compare that with your other findings. But when people are postured like this, it predisposes them to every single nerve entrapment possible. They can get subunit teres syndrome, they can get carpal tunnel syndrome, thoracic outlet, uh, piriformis syndrome, etc. And so what happens is you got to look at your peripheral nerve entrapment patients. you got somebody with pronator teres syndrome. 
and you want to fix their pronated Terry syndrome, you need to understand, is the pronated Terry syndrome caused locally because they have a spasm in that muscle, pinching that medial nerve, or is it brain-based? And the only way to know if it's brain-based is to start testing them and see if there's this pattern. That will give you, uh, hey, it's probably coming from the brain. Now, if it is coming from the brain, I mean that they have pronator teres on this side because of this brain fails. And to stimulate this brain, you actually adjust them on the left side of their body, which is opposite of what we would want to do. We'd say, well, this is broken, we want to work on this. But by working on this, you feed the left brain, you make discrepancy and activation worse, worse, and the pronator teres won't go away. And again, I put this back into vitalistic philosophy because we can't chase the symptoms in chiropractic. You need to look at the nervous system, evaluate it, and make the nervous system function better. If you're trying to chase symptoms and they have it hurts there and you try to make it work, it's not what we're about, guys. Because they've already been to three medical doctors by the time they get to your office trying to fix whatever's going on. And they failed. That's why they ended up there. So you don't go ahead and just do what those failed guys did. You take a unique approach, you look at the nervous system, you clear it. Um, increased pain, go back to. Increased pain, decreased global tone. Again, my dad has just always had problems on the right side of his body. He doesn't know why, but it's a right shoulder, a right hip, a right knee, all of them. Left side of his body is fine. That's another marker in your history to just give you an idea. But um, Dr. Carrick did this test. There was a study called blind spot mapping. And so this is what he found. This is fascinating to me, is that he was mapping the blind spots on each eye. And you guys understand how the blind spots work? There's an optic disc in the back of your eye that enters on the nasal portion. So that means on each eye in the temporal field, there's a blind spot. Now you don't see that blind spot because you have two eyes and it fills that in. But what happens is if you close one eye, you can actually map the size of the blind spot for each eye. So Carrick was doing this on people and he would see that the right blind spot would be bigger than the left on some people. On other people, it was opposite. So he threw away everybody with a bad, big left blind spot. He only kept the people with a big right blind spot. And then what he would do is he would adjust some C2 on the right or C2 on the left. Now what he did was when he would adjust them C2 on the right, the blind spot would get smaller. When he would adjust some C2 on the left, the blind spot would get bigger. And now this is what was going on, is that the left brain was failing. That's why that blind spot was bigger initially. So he would adjust them on the right side, and that would stimulate the left brain. It would become higher in its level of integration, and it would fill the blind spot, and the blind spot would get smaller. However, if he adjusted them on the left side, he's stimulating the right brain, and the different discrepancy got worse. The blind spot got bigger. Now, all of what this is trying to say is that there is a huge importance to the sightedness you adjust on your patient. Um, adjusting them on the left or on the right is going to make a difference based on their brain lesion. So if you're doing diversify, you need to evaluate your patients to see which brain is functioning higher, which one's lower, and you need to adjust them contralateral to the lower functioning brain. That will balance out their system. That's how functional neurology practices for the most part. That's a big part of what I've learned in that program. Um, so let's move on. we got a lot to go through. Um, I'm at Life West, I'm actually president of Upper Cervical Club, and I specialize in what's going on with the Atlas, and for me, why I do Upper Cervical or I'm interested in it is because the Atlas, by far or none, has much more deleterious consequences to the nervous system than the other ones do. Now, I'm not going to say that a T6 double station is insignificant. It's important, but it's just not as damaging to the Atlas as the Atlas is, and we're going to talk about that really quickly. So a couple mechanisms is just muscle spindle mass. When you think about muscle spindles, we have subluxation, we have disaffrontation. If that subluxation is in the upper cervical, where there's much, much, much more muscle spindles per gram of tissue, then the disaffrontation response is going to be worse in the upper cervical, just because there's more mechanoreceptors in that area. Next. Dentate ligament theory. You guys understand that the dura mater, which surrounds the spinal cord, only attaches to the bones at the top and bottom. Only at occiput, C1, C2, C3, and then the sacral issues. The rest of the spine, the dura, is not connected to the bones. It's surrounded by fat. And so what this means is that 
Let's say you have an occiput right here and your atlas is twisted this way. That dural is actually <laughs> twisting and that's where these people start to get these cervicogenic headaches coming around the side. But as that dura twists, it pulls on the dentate ligaments that hold the spinal cord in the center of the canal. And now what you get is these waves of radiating tensions coming onto the sides of the spinal cord right at the brainstem. And if you guys understand basic anatomy, there's more messages going through at this level than there are at this level. So this has a much more deleterious effect because it's higher up. There's just more pathways going back and forth there. So that's the dentate ligament theory. Um, vestibular system is tremendous, and we spend a huge amount of time on the vestibular system in functional neurology. But essentially, the vestibular system lives in the cerebellum, yeah. the nodulus, has output that controls the movement of the eyes, controls the movement of the spine, and what helps you balance. So what feeds into the vestibular system is going to be input from your eyes, it's going to be input from your vestibular canals, it's going to be input from the cervical spine, primarily. Now in functional neurology, we look at all three. You could have uh, an eye that's weak and deviated this way, and that's going to cause bad vision, which is going to cause bad input to your vestibular system. Now you have dysfunction in your vestibular system. You can have the same thing with ears, or you can have an atlas subluxation. But the idea is any disruption to your vestibular system is going to skew its output. And where is its output going? To the paraspinals along the right <coughs> spine. And this is why somebody could have an L5 that's rotated and a T4 that's rotated because of a functioning, a bad functioning vestibular system. And in that case, that's where the brain is causing a subluxation, not a subluxation is causing harm to the brain. Now there are ways to differentiate which one is happening, but this is why in upper cervical sometimes we'll adjust the atlas, we'll get the vestibular system working well again and our low back pain goes away. It's because you reset the vestibular system and how it controls the rest of the spine. Next. Autonomics is another one. There was this awesome study it's really long, but Dan Murphy goes over it. And he talks about where are the afferents from the upper cervical firing to. And they're firing to the nucleus intermedius, which is in the medulla. And this nucleus intermedius then feeds to the nucleus tractus solitarius. And TS has output through cranial nerve 10. You guys know what the vagus nerve does? Everything, all your autonomics. And so what happens is if somebody's got a really funky atlas, it's gonna cause a problem of feed forward into that nucleus tractus solitarius and its output becomes aberrant and their autonomics fail. And this is why when you adjust somebody's atlas and their constipation goes away, or their heart rate goes down, or so many other autonomic changes instantly. It's really cool. One more. All right, that's enough for atlas for now. Now we talk about neuroplasticity, and have you guys all heard of neuroplasticity or seen it? Watching neuroplasticity is really amazing. Because you'll have a neuron right here, and it's got a branch coming out, and you'll literally watch it grow a new branch and make a new synapse. And so what happens is whenever you have a neural pathway in your brain that you're reliant on, or you need to use more often, your brain adapts by neuroplasticity, by growing new connections, and then making the machinery within the <coughs> neuron more efficient, upregulating its ATP production, upregulating all of its protein production, etc. And so, I think neuroplasticity is fascinating because to me it's the same thing as innate intelligence. Innate intelligence is kind of this vitalistic term of a underwhelming, uh, undermining intelligence in the body that kind of keeps us self-healing and self-adapting. Neuroplasticity is a neurologic term about how we self-adapt to our changing environments. We need to run more, we need to be a better runner because we live in the Amazon. Our brain says, well, we need to upregulate running, and the, the pathways that control that go through neuroplastic changes. So how do we get neuroplasticity is really cool because chiropractic actually stimulates it. So it's about this NMDA receptor, and when you open this guy, calcium comes into the cell, stimulates the DNA, you make DNA changes, you grow new proteins, you grow new ATP, you grow new membrane, and you sprout new connections. And the NMDA receptor is very stubborn. And so to stimulate the NMDA receptor adequately, a diversified adjustment is fantastic, actually. Because you, so this is why I see going back to the little yellow lights uh, that we started with. When you adjust somebody, 
this whole area lights up. It gets brighter, and that surges to the brain and starts opening these receptors, and then you get neuroplastic changes within the brain. Again, this is why sometimes we've heard of chiropractic miracles. You guys have all heard of a chiropractic miracle where, like, boom, one adjustment, that person is, like, a hundred times better because they create an immediate neuroplastic change in that person's brain. That's fascinating. But some people are further away from threshold. Some people have a higher level of transdural degeneration, and they're going to need more care to reach neuroplasticity. Now, Carrick Institute is all about how do we create neuroplastic changes within their brain. Um, the adjustment's a good way to do it, but there's other ways. Now, you want to get the cell to summate, you can do it through temporal or spatial summation. You guys know the difference between those? Temporal summation is buff, 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 buff. Spatial summation is two firing at the same time. So how do you get temporal summation? Adjust them here, then here, then here. Quickly, one, two, three. And that will just add the stimulus onto it until it can reach that neuroplastic threshold. Or you can go through spatial summation. And this is the one I prefer because <coughs> that means that you have to do two stimuli at the same time. And those two stimuli will combine in their summative <coughs> force, bring that neuron to threshold, and then you get neuroplasticity. So how do we do this? How do we use spatial summation in practice? You want to stimulate the system concurrently with your adjustment. So I think maybe have them walk beforehand. By having them walk, they're generating afferents to the brain, and that's getting it higher to threshold and closer to summation. And then put them on your table and what I actually do is, before I'm setting up and I've got a big adjustment coming, I'll actually tell them to have an affirmation, essentially. So I had a girl that had trouble sleeping, and I didn't think that my adjustment was gonna get her to go home and sleep. So I put her on the table, and for about five minutes, she's closing her eyes, doing some deep breathing, and I'm telling her, imagine yourself going home, getting the best night's sleep, and I was very, very um, specific and how I described this to her. And so when she was visualizing herself there in the perfect night's sleep, that's when I delivered the adjustment and we summated that input. She went home, she slept for 14 hours. So that was kind of cool. It's trying to use some of this mental rehearsal to get closer to neuroplastic changes. Um, how does the adjustment fire into the brain? I don't think we were ever taught this in chiropractic school. And like, to me, that's such tragedy because this is fascinating how it actually travels through the brain. So I'm seeing this. But you would do this adjustment and you create this surge of light and I see it surge up to the brain and start to ripple. And that's why I kind of painted in these little yellow ripple effects. And so when you adjust, where does that signal go? Well, you guys know it goes to the spinal cord, through the dorsal column, spinal cerebellar tract, up to the brain. First stop is the brain stem, and as it lights up the brain stem, the areas of the brain stem that were through transdermal degeneration start to wake up, and their functions start to come back. And there's spillover. Spillover is where you'll fire into the nucleus bacillus in the brain stem, and this will light up, and the nucleus right next to it will also start to light up too. And so when you think about the brain stem, think about what it controls. You think about autonomics, cranial nerves, sleep cycles, all of these vital functions in the brainstem begin to function a little bit better. Now in Carrick Institute, we can do a little bit more detailed or specific types of approaches. Let's say you're trying to get their pons to work better because you really want their cranial nerve seven to start firing again. We can adjust the TMJ joint because that's gonna have more input to the pons than the spinal adjustment will. However, the spine is will input to all these areas of brainstem. Big one is going to be to the cerebellum. I mean, cerebellum is like more neurons than the cortex. This little tiny brain is so efficient at organizing not just movement and balance and motor learning, but also there's cognitive loops and emotional loops that happen in the cerebellum. And as you adjust people, the cerebellum lights up like a Christmas tree, it starts functioning higher, and cerebellum's output becomes better. What does it control? All these things. And this is why we can adjust little kids and increase their ability to, of motor learning. <coughs> these kids can actually ride bikes better, they can balance better and play better because you're increasing integration in their cerebellum. And again, this is not just vitalistic philosophy, this is science. 
but when you combine the two, it's connected by those rooms. Thalamus is fantastic. Every input goes through the thalamus, but when you light up the thalamus with the adjustment as it finally feeds forward to that area and becomes more efficient, the thalamus becomes more efficient. Now the thalamus can, will take different sensory parts. It will take light and it will take sound and it will combine them to make perception. This is where we first get perception of what's going on in the world around us in the thalamus. And so if you can increase the integration of the thalamus, this person can become more aware of what's going on in the world around them. This is my explanation of how Hardy Mueller got his hearing back. He snapped him on the neck, maybe on the thoracic, depends what story you hear. Fed forward to his thalamus, thalamus grew a little bit brighter, combined his sensory input of hearing into perception and he was able to hear. And so that sensory input from his ears was coming in the whole time. There is no nerve that can get pinched by a bone out of place as far as hearing is concerned, but that's what happened. Now, another really profound input of the adjustment is going to be to the parietal lobes. Um, so if you adjust them on the right side, you input their left parietal lobe, and that's responsible for touch. So I had another girl that she was normal on this side, but hyperesthesic on this side. Everything she felt on the whole left side of her body was just increased in perception. And so I adjusted her on the left side twice. I did a rib move, I did a cervical move. Her right parietal lobe started to function a little bit better, and it was able to dampen that hyperesthesia, dampen some of her pain. And so that's why, again, unilateral adjustment can make a really big difference in some people. So parietal lobes are big. Now, also parietal lobes become implicated in learning disabilities, and this is why some kids with ADD, ADHD, respond really well to chiropractic. Because we adjust them, we increase integration, modulation in the parietal lobe, that's able to function better and increase their spatial awareness, um, their body, et cetera, et cetera. The final one is the frontal lobe. And I'm hesitant when I talk about the frontal lobe, go for it, because once this adjustment finally gets to the frontal lobe, it's petered out quite a bit. There's only spinal trickles that are ending up in that frontal lobe. But if you guys understand how significant the frontal lobe really is to our human ability, it's incredible that the adjustment can increase the integration in this area. Because the frontal lobe is what makes us human. Animals don't have frontal lobes, humans have frontal lobes. They allow us to think and plan and visualize and have compassion, etc. And when this area fails, people become less human. When you adjust them and you get this area working better, they become more human. They can think clearer, they can plan better, they can work harder and make more money, and they can support their families better, and their whole lives improve by you increasing the integration in their frontal lobe tremendously. And this is why to me, this whole loop right here, chiropractic is the most incredible thing on the planet. Because there is no drug ever that can light up the brain like this. There will never be a drug that can do this. We can actually light somebody's nervous system and bring it back functioning online and watch their lives come back. Not just through vitalistic philosophy again, but, but through actual neurologic loops that surge through the brain. Do you guys understand that? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So you guys should not be timid. Um, this drives me crazy is when chiropractors act timid or we feel like we're less than medical doctors or less than that. We have to be like sticking out our chest and strutting because we are proud because we have one of the best products on the planet. Okay, so I talk, again, about upper cervical adjusting. Adjustments are incredible, but upper cervical adjustments, I just find to be super incredible with some of what they do. These are three studies that I pulled for you guys, but there's hundreds out there. What I think is all three of these are profound. Uh, the first one, you guys heard about the NUCA blood pressure study. They were doing NUCA on people. One adjustment lowered their blood pressure 17 points systolically, 10 points diastolically. That lasted for eight weeks from one adjustment. That's better than two hypertensives put together. Again, we can begin to understand how this blood pressure lowered by the nucleus tractus solitarius, nucleus intermedius loop we talked to about earlier before. But this is profound because who in America has high blood pressure? Everybody. Everybody. So where would we stand in the marketplace if we could prove that we were effective and reproducible at doing this? It was just research that needed to be done. This was awesome. HIV patients, 
So they took 10 HIV patients, five were controls, five were getting adjusted raw stick. The five controls lost 8% of their CD4 count over the next five months. You would expect that. They had AIDS, they killed CD4s. However, the people under upper cervical had a 48% increase in their CD4 count in five months from one adjustment. Again, profound. And that's not just that, hey, we can help AIDS patients. It's, hey, we can make the immune system of anybody function at a higher level. Now, what I like about this, again, is that I don't have a neural loop to explain how upper cervical can increase somebody's immune system function, but the body's intelligent far more than we'll ever be able to fully comprehend. And that's part of the reason why it's important to stay humble when you're approaching chiropractic neurology. But chiropractic doesn't get old, and we watch it every day. The last one is a uh, little girl with scoliosis, 15, 44 degrees scoliosis, heading to surgery. Again, one adjustment, five months later, her curve was down to 32 degrees. I mean, just a tremendous difference. The girl avoided surgery. So again, adjusting the upper cervical can change the vestibular system and change curves throughout the entire spine. So that's kind of where I start to focus. Go ahead. These are just a couple um, pictures that I found in one of my textbooks, but these are all upper cervical patients. Um, these two on the side, those are same day adjustments. And you see that curve in their cervical coming right back. And um, again, this is through the vestibular system, but I think this is profound because if you have less input to the system, but greater return, it's, that's, what, that's what everybody should be doing, is how can we get better results with less intervention? Throughout all the medicine, throughout everything. And so I just think these are really profound especially those lumbar curves, just straightening out when they're not even touching the lumbar. So let's finish up. I've got a couple management strategies for you guys before we wrap up, um, but how do you want to practice? I've been reading a lot of James Chestnut. Have you guys heard of Chestnut before? Mm -hmm. Highly recommend him. But he talks about a wellness versus a treatment. And how do you want to practice? Do you want to be seeing people that are in pain and trying to address that pain, find the problem and get rid of it for them? Or do you wanna be having interventions that make people better overall, no matter who they are? And I think the second one's a little bit more appealing because then we can help anybody and we can have a little bit easier of a time doing it, but we know that no matter what, that person's gonna benefit from our intervention. Um, okay. I mean, my bottom line is what can we do to increase their neurologic integrity? at the bottom, but what can we do to make the nervous system function better? Because again, chiropractors aren't about bones, we're about the friggin' nervous system. And I just proved to you that what we do has a tremendous input on that nervous system. But what else can we do to make their nervous system function at a higher level overall? So, go ahead. This is what I do for a living. I just try to make those lines look a little bit straighter. Uh, Mr. I can't say his name, had extreme pain on that right side of his neck because his head was falling over to the left because his atlas was high. And when we take x-rays, I'm able to measure them within a hundredth of a degree. Um, this guy had five different misalignments in his upper cervical spine. We were able to calculate for him exactly how to correct that. And we moved him back to orthogonal right here. So his atlas became level, his neck became 90 degrees with it, he became upright under gravity, and his neck pain went away because his neck was fighting to keep his head up as he was falling over to the side. And then as his neck was pulling him over, then he starts getting this ribcage thoracic tightness that would go away for a little bit when it would get adjusted, but it would return immediately. And so this is how I approach people. Go ahead. This is how I do it. This is called advanced orthogonal. That's an $18,000 table. Everything is motorized on it. With it, I'm able to mock, change their shoulder placement, their head piece height, and I'm able to put that little needle within a hundredth of a degree. Some people in my role need to be adjusted at 12 degrees. Some people need to be adjusted at 15 degrees. And that makes all the difference. I did a little bit of math on this thing. I think they can do about 2.6 million different adjustments, depending on their unique misalignment. I think it's a little bit more specific than right, left. And that's kind of why I chose it. And for me, you see really awesome results when you do this. This is where I specialize. Now, my approach is I'm going to do six weeks of just 
only is that senior officer ever told. And in that time, we usually see about three out of the five complaints resolved completely. By that six week reeval, if, if the pain is still lingering, then I can go ahead and do a little bit diversified. Doing it on the side of hemispherosity is important. Staying within their metabolic threshold. I'll do activator, graftin, whatever they need. But I'm not chasing their pain initially. I'm putting their nervous system back on so it can function the highest possibility it can. Um, exercise is really important. I hope you guys understand how important it is. This is a little paper, um, Waging War on Physical Inactivity in the Journal of Applied um, Physiology. And all of these changes right here come from 30 minutes a day of walking. I mean, who cannot walk 30 minutes a day? Nice. There's a couple more. So if you are not telling your patients that they need to be exercising every visit, in my opinion, you're not, you're not practicing evidence-based medicine. Because there's no drug that can provide the same benefits to the body as walking can. And if they're good at walking, challenge them, give them something a little bit harder. You guys need to be pushing this every single time. Everybody can benefit from walking. Everybody can benefit from a little bit more stability. So I give everybody planks, and I give everybody sit-ups, and I give everybody side planks. Next. Nutrition, again, so important. We talked about transitional degeneration. If they're not getting the right energy input, they're going to have problems in TMD. So everybody can benefit from less sugar, less gluten. Read Wheat Belly if you have time. It will traumatize you about gluten forever. Um, milk is another one. A lot of people are allergic to milk. So you can either send them for allergy testing or you can tell them to eliminate this for six weeks, see how they feel, and slowly start reintroducing things and see what they react to. Everybody benefits from a multivitamin. Everybody benefits from fish oil and increasing their omega-3s. Everybody benefits from vitamin D especially because we're getting like one ten thousandth as much vitamin D in sun exposure as we're supposed to have. Vitamin D supports everything. Immune system, brain, heart, bones, everything. The last one I really like is curcumin that I started using on my patients. Very, very powerful antioxidant producer. Upregulates glutathione in the brain. Now they have less free radical damage in their brain and you see tremendous results pretty quickly with curcumin. <sighs> Mindset's the last one I really focus on. I mean, to me, to have the best life possible, you gotta have a healthy functioning nervous system, healthy functioning exercise, healthy food, healthy mindset. And almost every single one of my patients gets prescribed one of these. Now, when we talk about frontal lobe and how the adjustment weakly powers the frontal lobe, positive affirmations are direct exercise to the frontal lobe. And if you give somebody a positive affirmation and tell them Every day I want you to look in the mirror and tell you, tell yourself you're great 10 times. You'll increase your functioning in their frontal lobe by that affirmation. Their brain will bright, glow a little bit brighter and they'll have a healthy, more fulfilling 